that, that artificial intelligence is more dangerous than, than nuclear weapons. And that's a potentially. <laughs> and, and, oh, it goes on. It goes on. It just goes on. You, you, say, you say that it's like summoning the demon. Could be. <laughs> How do you consolidate, rationalize the, the, that conflict between artificial intelligence, of course, deep learning that, that obviously is going to be very important to self that? How do you think for that? Well, I, I don't think we have to worry about uh, autonomous cars, because that's sort of like a narrow form of AI. Um, and it's not, not something that I think is very difficult, actually, the, to, to do autonomous driving to a degree that's much safer than a person is much easier than people think. Yeah. I think it's going to just become normal, like it'll be like an elevator. Like, no, they used to have elevator operators. Um, and then we, you know, developed some simple circuitry to have elevators just automatically come to the floor that you, you're at and you can just press the button and you, nobody needs to operate the elevator. Uh, the car is just going to be like that. <laughs> and the elevators these days are even smarter. I mean, it knows, it knows where to position an elevator so, so that uh, if you were to need an elevator, it's pretty close to you. Cars in the future will be pretty smart about that too. Yeah, you'll be able to tell your car, like, take me home, uh, go here, go there, anything. Uh, and it'll just do it. Yeah, and, it and, yeah and an order of magnitude safer than a person. Mm -hmm. and in fact, in the, in the distant future, I think it's probably going to be if people may outlaw driving cars mm -hmm. uh, because it's too dangerous. Like, you, you can't have a person driving a two-ton death machine. <laughs> Now, if we, if we have the right type of intelligence in a car, we, we also don't have to make the cars that heavy, I would think. You know, cars are getting yeah. heavier and heavier, and it's got more and more stuff in it because it needs to survive all these incredible collisions and things like that. If, uh, I wonder if, if we were to, to, to design cars that, that just simply don't collide as much, um, I wonder if we could, we could uh, relax on some of those laws and, and yeah. make cars more fuel efficient and lighter and better. <laughs> You could definitely do that. If you could count on not, not having an accident, then you can uh, get, get rid of a huge amount of the crash structure and the airbags. Um, and uh, it'll be, we're a long way from that because there's always going to be some, for, for a very long time, there'll be some amount of legacy cars on the road. Uh, and, I, and I think it, it is important to just appreciate uh, the size of the automotive industrial base. Like, it's not as though, like, when somebody makes an autonomous car that suddenly all the cars will be autonomous. It's like there's two billion of them. Okay, so the, the, the total total number of cars and trucks on the road is, is two billion and climbing. The uh, capacity of, of car and truck production is about 100 million a year. So if tomorrow all cars were autonomous, it would take 20 years to replace the fleet, assuming the fleet stayed the same size. Arguably it could get smaller if things are autonomous. But still, it's and it's still, you know, maybe 15 years or something. And it's not all going to transition immediately. It'll take quite a while. So, and it's the same for electrification of cars. Um, it, it changing that industrial base to be electric. I mean, if, if all cars were suddenly, if all cars produced were electric tomorrow, it would still take 20 years to replace the, the fleet. Uh, and right now it's less than one percent. So, now you you um, you're, you mentioned just now about about self-driving cars being easier than people think. Now you, you have a, your vision of, of how to go from where we are today. Now my model my P eighty five D has uh, lane detection, and, and so it gets a little you know when I get close to a to a lane, yep. uh, it detects the the uh, uh, the speed signs, and it uses a, uses a, a computer vision technology to do that. And, but, and that's today's ADAS. What is your, what is your roadmap? You know, how is that different than other people's roadmap? How do you think about how to get to self driving cars? Yeah, well, um, you, you kind of need the, the, the hardware foundation, the sort of sensor and computing foundation. And then you can keep uploading new software, at least you can with the Tesla, because it's, it's always connected. Um, so the, the car that you have, you'll notice like it, it's, the, the features are st steadily improving. Uh, we now you know, have uh, active cruise control, so it'll, it'll use uh, radar and camera fusion to track the car in front of you. Um, it's also looking at, at with, with the, some of the things that are coming out, it's got, it, it looks at the brake lights, so it anticipates that the car's got, the brake lights are active. Uh, it's gonna get basically smarter and smarter, even with the current hardware suite. So the current hardware suite is 360 degree ultrasonic sensors that go up to about uh, just over five meters. It's a Ford camera and a Ford radar. So we'll, we'll make, 
even with just, just that sensor suite, we can actually make uh, huge progress in autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, we can certainly make the car steer itself on, on a freeway, we can you know, do lane changes. Uh, it, it's really, autonomy is about what level of reliability and safety uh, do you want. Uh, even with the current sensors, we, we could make the car go fully autonomous, but only to, but, but not to a level of reliability that would be safe in, say, uh, a uh, complex, uh, open environment at 30 miles an hour where the lane markings are there and children could be playing um, and things could be coming at you from the side. So in order to solve that, you need a, a, a bigger sensor suite uh, and you need more computing power. Uh, and I think what you're doing actually with the, the Tegras in the future is, is super interesting and will really be a big enabler uh, for autonomous driving. Problem. Like, we know exactly what to do and we'll be there in a few years. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, just, just like Mars. Mars is not quite as small. Uh, that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, 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 the spirit of, of innovators. And the, in, in a lot of ways, in your mind, you kind of, you kind of see things solvable um, or arguably, arguably solved. And, and um, a lot of it is, is really about getting there. Yeah, we'll take autonomous cars for granted quite a short period of time. It's amazing how comfortable you get and how quickly you become full with it. Um, so, um, now what about government yeah. Government policies? Like one of the things that I would like to do is I would, I would just like to keep working on my email as I'm driving to work. Sure. You know, there's, there's a... Some people will some people do that already. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I, I would like to do it without, without, uh, without breaking the law. Ah, yes. uh, uh, so, so where, <laughs> Where, where, do you, where, where do you think government intervention falls in, in some of this stuff? Because, you know, obviously if your car drives by itself and it does it even better than people, mm -hmm. you would like it to drive by itself, but largely the laws don't allow you to do that today. Right, absolutely. So how do we cross that bridge and, and, and how do you think about government intervention regulations? Right, so I think uh, it, it'll be from the point at which a car is definitely safer than a person, um, there's probably at least another two or three years after that before regulators will allow that to be the case because they will want to see uh, a large amount of statistical proof that it's not merely as safe as a person but much safer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think what you can do is you can run, run it in shadow mode mm -hmm. and essentially say, okay, this is, this is what the computer would have done in all these circumstances mm -hmm. and was there a crash or was there not? Like what are the false positives, false, false negatives? Mm -hmm. uh, and then... It's, you know, you know, it's achieve a, a large population group, and then and then make a really clear statistical argument uh, with the regulators, mm -hmm. and then they're going to digest that, observe it for a while, see if they agree with it, and and then I think they will because the evidence will be overwhelming. Yeah, and the evidence is actually already quite overwhelming. That if you if you uh, if you uh, would have would have noticed a brake light in front of you on the highway and you didn't you didn't uh, crash into it, you were in collision. Right. So a lot of lives are safe. You know, ideally, ideally, hopefully, um, people don't don't overreact with this with this unknown technology um, and uh, and prematurely regulate. No premature yeah. regulations. If well, you, I mean, regu regu regulators. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, when, when it comes to public safety, I think there's there's an argument for being you know quite cautious and. And making sure that things are okay before before there's a change, uh, and um, I mean I, I don't think it's the case that right now there's a fully autonomous system and regulators are not approving it. Uh, that that could really be a substitute for people, but there will be in a few years. We have a mechanical failure of some kind, or, or a logic failure, a fundamental logic failure. So you can always overwhelm the, the the braking of the car with your foot, and you can overwhelm the steering wheel with your hands. So. Uh, but but when, when there isn't a steering wheel, or there isn't you know, a brake pedal or something like you know, many years from now, then it's really, really dangerous. You know, cause, uh, but, but even as it is right now, what we spend most of our time on is making sure that it's, it's very difficult to do um, a multi-car hack. Like, if you have direct access to a car, just like if you've got direct access to a computer or, or any, even a conventional car, but that, that's less of a concern than somebody being able to hack an arbitrary car or multiple cars. So that's what we, we focus our energy on, is making sure that that, in, in, in that way, it's, it's, it's a lot like a, 
like a cell phone or, or a laptop, uh, you know, you, you focus on making sure that they, they can't, or that it's very difficult for there to be any kind of system-wide hack. Um, so we take over all of put a lot of effort into that, and we have third parties try to attack it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in certain parts of the, the car, at, at the very fundamental level, like the drive unit controller uh, or the steering controller, have a, an additional level of security. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so somebody may be able to, uh, you know, ha hack something that's uh, cosmetic, but it's much harder to hack something that's that's actually physically dangerous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple levels mm -hmm. of security. Yeah. So this way, if you if you were able to penetrate maybe the infotainment system, it doesn't allow yeah, you quickly exactly. as a result of that. Yes. Right. I mean, it may display a funny message or something, but it would not you would not be able to then control the steering or the the motor. Yeah.